as long as someone of some Pofo is there. But a statement is just coming through from the uh, NDC, is signed by its General Secretary Johnson and Sidum I'm going to read it verbatim. He says, The rank and file of our party, as well as the general public, is informed that our national chairman, uh, Honorable Samuel of Fosampofo on Tuesday afternoon tendered himself into a police uh, following an arrest warrant produced by the police. Consequently, the police have proceeded to search the home of Mr. Fosampofo. The full complement of the party's legal team is in touch with the police and is closely monitoring the situation. A team of senior party officials is also currently on standby at the police headquarters to attend to the situation. Also, it continues that the NDC members, supporters, and the general public are urged to remain calm and await information on any course of action the party deems fit in these circumstances. So that's a, a statement coming through from the NDC signed by the General Secretary of the Party, Johnson Esidum Ketia. Alfred, we'll certainly keep our eyes on that. But let's head to Parliament now as the leadership of Parliament has expressed outrage at a recent University of Ghana Political Science Department survey on the performance of MPs. Reacting to the poll that ranks of members of Parliament, Speaker of Parliament, Professor Michael Quay, slammed the researchers for what he describes as inciting the public against the MPs. The poll published on Monday stated over 186 MPs are likely to lose their seats. The survey had 42.6% of the respondents ready to retain their lawmakers with 7.9% of the respondents still undecided. Majority of the respondents representing 46.7% do not want their incumbent MPs to contest in 2020 general elections while 42.4% want their MPs to contest, with 10.9% still undecided on whether their MPs should contest or not. An enraged first Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Joe Sewusu, wants the researchers dragged before the House for further explanations. I think it is incumbent upon us to assist them to be able to do it in a manner which will reflect the true, the, the true role uh, of, of a member of Parliament. In this circumstances, Speaker, I wish to uh, recommend that the group that is involved in the research be invited to meet with a group here to discuss with them what are the constitutional rules, what are the others, and then agree on modalities and the parameters. Minority Leader Harun Idrisu says the report is just only targeting MPs to make them unpopular. This is a threat to our survivor, and this pronouncement will amount to declaring all of us as we have been declared as non-performing MPs, even though I admit that there is a role conflict and there is confusion every other day as to the role of an MP. But Mr. Speaker, that confusion should not emanate from a university when ordinary members of the public who probably are uneducated or not better educated come to those assumptions and conclusions, they can be forgiven. But to come from academia is even more worrying, and therefore I support the first speaker that we get a committee to engage them, to appreciate the basis of the work that they have done. We will explain our part to enrich, to enrich the work they do. On the workings of Parliament, as spelled out in the Constitution, Speaker Professor Michael Quay is less enthused about the report. No road, no vote is not part of the MP's work. Honorable members of Parliament are not voted any sums of money to construct roads. I plead that we should understand these things because honorable members of Parliament are representatives of the people so elected to be touting that they are going to leave the house en masse because of what somebody else is saying is not fair to the institution of parliament or to the people's own representative power. In fact, it might tantamount to incitement and it is not fair. For the legislature, let's go into the judiciary where there is growing discontent among members of the Association of Magistrates and Judges Ghana 
over the non-payment of allowances due them. TV3 has got a, the situation could compel them to withdraw their services. Thomas Adote Papo has more. Government owes judges over two years of book allowance while payment of robin allowance has ceased. They have not been granted fuel allowance this year, even though they are entitled to it. Incessant calls to the Ministry of Finance to pay the outstanding allowances have yielded no response. Members of the association TV3 Gathers are frustrated given that in previous years, they experienced similar delays, but due to the attendance of their profession, they have suffered in silence. Some lawyers have waded into the concerns raised by judges and magistrates. If a judge who is not reading or oppressed with the current position of the law, he will go to court and when the judge if is even, will not even be confident, the judge will not exude that confidence when the cases are being tried. But if you appear before a judge who is sound and knows his law, everybody is happy. So it tells you that, yes, the judge who has his condition of services, which is being fulfilled, he has some job satisfaction, would deliver and deliver quality judgment. That when you even read and you even lose, you'll be happy and know that I should have done A, B, C, D. But if the judge is not being given his allowances, he can't afford to buy the law books, the test books, the law reports, I'm telling you that that will not be good. Some of the judges are incensed, especially when their colleague Article 71 office holders promptly receive what is due them. This is not the first time judges have experienced delays in the payment of the allowances. A member of the Constitutional, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs in Parliament, Roxin Defiamapo, attempted to diagnose the situation. The problem has been that the judiciary itself comes to Parliament with a combined budget, a budget that consists of activities for both members of the judiciary, quasi-judiciary, and members of the judicial service. Now, when you do that, the executive is of the opinion that they, are, they will slash the estimate. You are unable to raise the legal argument of a breach of the Constitution. We have urged the government in other fora to ensure that even if you won't pay other critical service workers, you don't play with allowances meant for judges, and particularly so superior court judges. He intends filing a question in Parliament to the Attorney General to respond to the myriad of challenges confronting judges. And speaking to some lawyers, it is clear judges play a critical role in the determination of cases in this country. The sheer volume of work, the number of cases they have to read to come up with a judgment. As we speak, judges are given very little by way of remuneration. Former Speaker of Parliament, the late Peter Lajete, once said that the working conditions of judges is utterly poor. Thomas Altaipapo, TV3. Well, let's turn to some other top stories this evening. As the Australian High Commission in Ghana has cautioned its nationals not to use taxis or other public transport in the country. The update adds that violent crime, including kidnapping, targeting Westerners, particularly women, has increased in Ghana recently. The Australian government becomes the third after Canada and the United Kingdom to update its foreigners' travel advice on Ghana in seven days. Advice to all our Australians overseas. So this is part of the normal business where we actually monitor the situation in every country very closely. We updated the content of travel advice to draw attention to Australians that when they're taking Uber and things like that, they need to be a bit more careful. An update the Australian government urgently deemed necessary in the wake of recent kidnappings. In the last one year, reports of kidnappings have been on the increase with the security agencies on the alert 
but yet to make a major inroad. The latest is the abduction of two Canadian nationals in Kumasi after oh, no, the attack no, no. the girls are yet to be found. For the Australian government, many of their nationals are engaged in large commercial mining with significant capital injections in the country. We started organising this many months ago and it was in response to some clear uh, concerns and interests by Australian mining companies operating across West Africa uh, about the growing instability, particularly coming out of uh, Burkina Faso uh, and the continuing and growing problems in Mali next door and how that was affecting the region. We saw in uh, Benin a couple of months ago, the two French uh, people were kidnapped uh, and so the Australian mining companies operating across the region wanted to be better informed about what was going on and what they could expect in the future. The greater security concern is a cross-border crime and terrorists who are making their way into the country from the northern side. To be able to announce today that Australian government will be contributing 75,000 Australian dollars towards an interagency counter-terrorism course to be run by the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Centre. Uh, we believe uh, that one of the key things that needs to be done around issues like this, and certainly Australia has some experience in dealing with this in our region as well. The Australian government has summoned some 200 mining companies in the West African sub-region to a security briefing on the current state of security in the sub-region. Now, this statement comes after what happened also with the Canadian uh, High Commission here. And then there's a statement that's also been issued by the Information Minister responding to some of these concerns that have been raised by other nationals in this country. Government says there is no actionable intelligence nor imminent threat to Ghana. A statement signed by Information Minister Kujopong Kroma said Ghana's safety and risk profiles remain largely unchanged despite recent events in the sub-region. According to the statement, national security officials held a meeting on Monday, June 10, at the Jubilee House to examine the recent travel advisories about Ghana and intelligence reports on Ghana's security situation. Ghana's security apparatus, the statement added, continues to be retooled and vigilant to tackle any major security threat within the jurisdiction government advise Ghanaians, foreign residents and visitors to continue to go about their normal ways of life without fear but urge them to be security conscious as always government further encourage potential visitors that just like other western jurisdictions isolated incidents of crime should not undermine the general safety and hospitality for which ghana is so well known It starts to smile the news this evening as the chiefs mm. and people of Bongbong in the Yendi municipality have petitioned government for a new district. At a news conference, they argued that carving out a new district from the Yendi municipality with Bongbong as its capital will bring the needed development to the area. Here's reports by Christopher Amako. The petition was signed by more than 100 chiefs and opinion leaders from Bumbong and its adjoining communities. The chiefs and people argued that the population of the area was over 90,000, which is above the 75,000 requirement under the Local Government Act. Moreover, the proposed district with more than 200 communities and 10 electoral areas was more than what others had to qualify for a district. Mio and Bushid Good Districts has created a homogeneous landmass lying along 60 kilometer stretch of the Eastern Corridor Road from Yendi to Bushegu of Konkomba tribes without a single district and which are far from their respective district capitals. This does not augur well for the spirit of self determination, growth, and development. Most of the electoral areas are too large and cover too many communities, which makes effective local governance challenging. 
Ubor Wumbe Dawuni appealed to government to consider their request which will ultimately spare the development of the area. It is our fervent conviction that our petition will be approved by our dear president, Nana Adodankwa Ekupwa. He listed the construction of a library and other interventions by the traditional authority and pledged their commitment to augment government support. Area encompassing the proposed Bumbon district has no tertiary or secondary school. We believe the creation of the district will lead to the improvement of infrastructure in the area. An opinion leader, Lad de Marcos, explained her reason for signing the petition. In Bongo, we only have only one set, a health center, which is far away from Yendi, sharing three, boundary, uh, three districts, which is Myung District, Yendi District, and uh, Bushogu District. And if a pregnant lady come or a patient come, they have to rather tra refer that patient to what? Yendi to assess health. Uh, <laughs> On our MTN video report tonight, our citizen journalist Julio Sadade highlights the constant flooding on the main road leading to Community 25 in the Tama and warns city authorities to ensure that the bridge on that stretch of road is widened. The main road leading to Community 25, this is the big gutter which is overflowing and the bridge is just small as there. So water cannot pass through the bridge. But if we were to have enough space under the bridge or the bigger space, all this water convey here have to overflow the road, quickly goes through the bridge. Now look at the number of cars stuck over there. The water now bypasses another main. Look at how it's also making here. This is what we have here. This is just the small portion, the bridge, but the bigger portion of the water overflow the boundary. This is Julius Saturday reporting from Bejaku. The same situation has been reported in Nanakrom and the Lakeside Estates as well. But you can send your video report by WhatsApp number 055. One four three three zero four four. Absolutely, do stay with us here on News Three Six. We've got a lot more news coming up for you shortly. Well, welcome back to News Three Sixty. Delving into the business segment this evening, starting off with World Bank Country Director Henry Kerali, who's lauded the central bank's move to close some. 347 microfinance companies at a media engagement in Accra, he said the non-bank financial sector needs to come under stronger regulation to create a more conducive environment for business. Last month, the Bank of Ghana revoked the licenses of 347 microfinance companies. The shutdown was due to insolvency. The action, according to the central bank, was taken pursuant to Section 1231 of the Banks and Specialized Deposit Taking Institutions Act 2016, Act 930, which requires the Bank of Ghana to revoke the licenses of a bank or specialized deposit taking institution, SDI, when it determines that the institution is insolvent or is likely to become insolvent within the next 60 days. World Bank Country Director Henry Corrali said, the regulator's move is highly commendable. Unfortunately, the same phenomenon has been experienced in the microfinance sector. Um, a lot of the microfinance houses or enterprises, as you will again have seen in the Bank of Ghana statement, were also operating at a loss uh, with huge risks to the depositors, most of whom happen to be small-time uh, depositors or small and medium enterprises. And so the risk to the economy was much larger. There was need for Bank of Ghana to take action, uh, which we strongly support. Uh, we do uh, congratulate, actually, the Bank of Ghana for taking some of these tough measures to ensure overall stability uh, in the banking sector. He stressed the need for stronger regulation to improve the financial environment and reduce the risk of doing business. There are literally thousands of these MFIs and the central bank does not have the numbers of people to provide the same level of oversight uh, for the MFIs uh, in particular. And all 
uh, specialized deposit taking institutions or SDIs have to come under stronger regulation and oversight. Urged the central bank to increase its capacity to regulate the large number of non-bank financial institutions to achieve the right sector reforms. Well, let's turn to issues on the livelihood of farmers as Vice President Dr. Mahamudu Bamia has proposed a living wage for smallholder cocoa farmers to enable them meet the operational needs and pension benefits. He was speaking at a workshop on improved wages for cocoa farmers in Accra. Ghana and Ivory Coast produce 65% of the world's cocoa but receive less than $5 billion annually. The situation has compelled the two countries not to increase the producer price of cocoa. The consistent complaints by farmers and unstable international prices have become a major setback. According to Cocoa Board, some farmers have begun converting their lands to other viable ventures. The living wage is expected to enable farmers to meet their operational needs and pension benefits. With 65% of global production, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire are cooperating to tackle common challenges in the production, marketing of cocoa, and to create a conducive platform for effective engagement with you, the traders, processors, manufacturers, and retailers on all relevant issues of mutual interest, including farmers' income. Um, the oil producers have OPEC, and they have less than 50% of the world's production. And so Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire will have COPEC. Uh, we will have 65%. The Minister of Agriculture, Dr. Uso Efi Yakoto, noted the decent wage would stimulate youth participation in the sector. The unbearable situation of low incomes will compel the farmers to switch to alternative crops or compromise the environment. It's already happening in Ghana. You go to western region of this country, farmers are already starting to switch from cocoa to rubber and other opportunities offered by other tree crops. Chief Executive Officer of Cocoa Board, Joseph Wahini Edu, said improved wages could boost cocoa production. We have every natural right to look for a better deal for our cocoa farmers and we, have jointly, and we have jointly invited you for cooperation on this matter and to strengthen our partnership as well as bilateral and multilateral relationships. Uh, to Parliament. As the minority in Parliament is demanding an explanation on Ghana's rising debt stock, serving notice to summon Finance Minister Ken Oforiata for answers, at a news conference in Accra, spokesperson on finance, Casio Atoforsen, insisted Information Minister Kojo Paul Nkrumah's assertion that government is managing the economy well is untrue. According to the minority, the country's debt profile pegged at 137 billion cities in 2016 has shot up to 200 billion. He attributed it to the president's culture of heavy borrowings with no projects to show nor to think up ideas that would make the economy productive. The 80 billion added to the public debt by President Akufuado represents only new debt and does not include monies borrowed to refinance maturing debt. President Ekufuado must therefore refrain from using this as an excuse as it is completely untenable. Despite this clarification, we know that it is the Mahama administration that holds the record of actually paying down debt. We urge the minister to compare the NPP record. He is touting with the substantive reduction in public debt with a single oil field and declining crude oil. We used 500 million US dollars of our own oil revenue to pay down the first sovereign debt issued by the then Kufuo administration, the MPP, in the year 2017. Government has denied reports of a ballooning debt stock, noting much of the debt are as a result of an incursion from the Eswal Maham administration. The minority spokesperson on finance, Kesela Tufos, in addressing a press conference on Tuesday, said the country's debt profile, which used to be 137 billion cities in 2016 has shot up to 200 billion. He attributed it to the president's culture of heavy borrowings with no projects to show nor to think up ideas that would make the economy productive. 
March of the Dead uh, as a result of an incursion from the Eswa Muhammad administration. We are going to obviously revoke the powers vested in us as members of parliament. summoning so ministers of state to appear before parliament, revoking where possible constitutional provisions, and then obviously to do motions on the for half an hour motions to get them to appear before parliament. As we speak, nobody knows the end December 2016 expenditure numbers. Even though per the laws of this country, the Minister of Finance should have appeared before parliament or provided information to parliament by the end of first quarter. We've ended second quarter, or we're about to end second quarter. It's all missing. So we are going to obviously um, uh, come out with half an hour motion to compel the minister responsible for finance to bring us those expenditure. Ghana's death talk as at March 2019 is 198 billion series. And that's how we wrap up the business segment this evening on News 360. But do visit our website. It's 3news.com for a lot more business stories. Alfred, over to you. Uh, thank you, Natalie, with business. Now, information available to TV3 indicates the owners of some basic schools in Togo charge junior high school pupils. Then in connivance with head teachers in Ghana, get the pupils enrolled in the basic education certificate examination portal for examinations in Ghana. Now, the headmaster of Kekele Preparatory School at Afao has been arrested for registering and allowing 62 pupils from Faith Mission International School in Togo to sit for the BEC in Ghana. Salomon Menya has more in this report. Information available to the news team indicates that the illegality by some Nigerians and Togolese has gone on for some 18 years. Communities in Togo, mostly dominated by Nigerians, engage in the practice. As at 2017, there were over 30 Ghanaian curriculum schools in Togo that enrolled Nigerian citizens. They include Wisdom International School, Light of the World International School, Trinity Gems, Divine Knowledge, Holy Child, and Sylvia Modern Academy. These schools are affiliated to some eight private schools based in the Ketu South municipality, with some of the Ghanaian schools affiliated to more than three of the Togolese schools. The eight schools in the Ketu South municipality include Kekeli Complex School, Assemblies of God Experimental School, Freedom International School, and ECOWAS International School. The investigation was triggered by the campaign promise of the then presidential candidate Nana Kufwado to introduce free senior high school education from September 2017. The team felt if such Ghanaian curriculum running schools in Togo with foreign students were allowed to continue with their affiliation with schools based in the Ketu South Municipal to write the BEC, it will mean enrolling and educating foreign students with Ghana's resources and hence increasing government expenditure. Statistically, these schools have an average of 35 pupils per school that usually sit for the basic education certificate examination in the Ketu South Municipal. Once these foreign pupils sit for the BEC, they become eligible for the free SHS. 30 schools engage in the illegality translate into 1,050 foreigners trooping to Ghana to enjoy free senior high education. Some have been duly placed by the Computerized School Selection Placement, CSSPS, as far back as 2016. What is more worrying is that these illegal businesses have taken a new twist following the ability of two of the schools in Togo, Sylvia Modern Academy and Sylvia Royal Montessori, owned by the same proprietress named Madame Enenna Samuel, had gotten her schools established in Togo registered under the Ghana Education Service. The school has been provided an index number whereby the name of her school in Togo appear on the basic education certificate examination of her past students. Having done all this, she has succeeded in mobilizing other schools in Togo to do same by devoting to help them acquire examination center numbers and currently advertising her plans to other school owners at a cost. Consequently, the structures and populations of these schools are good indicators that 
says schools in Togo and Nigerian students have prosperous future as far as their affiliation with Ghanaian schools in the Ketu South and beyond are concerned. Even though it is a requirement under the Education Act 2008, Act 778, for all basic schools to be recognized by the Ministry of Education, the Ministry could not readily confirm or deny that the 28 schools are on their list. Oh, serious. Um, Very. Um, District fact, Education yeah. Directorate will probably have some questions to answer uh, you know, about this. Certainly. We will be staying on this issue a lot further and bring you more in our subsequent bulletin. So do stay with us here on TV3. All right, so it's now time for some entertainment and lifestyle news with me, Nana Quedrado. Now, we're starting off from the home of Adesa, where five promising talents out of the initial 10 finalists are set to battle it out for the cash prize, movie deals, and the bragging right at the grand finale of the maiden edition of TV3's Next Top Actor. Now, Ima K, Susan, Farinad, Araba, and Lois, who will become the Next Top Actor come June 12th. It's been nine captivating weeks of the life-changing reality show as 10 promising actors have for the past weeks undergone grooming in building a successful acting career. I'm, I'm not getting the confidence that I'm looking for. This is a prepared speech. The way you're supposed to give it with the confidence and the conviction. So far, all of you, I'm not, I'm not getting that feel yet. So. In weekly episodes, finalists have exhibited their acting prowess in different roles. What? <laughs> But in line with the requirements of the show, only one lucky actor will walk away with a cash prize, movie deals, and bragging rights as Ghana's next stop actor. Unfortunately, with 10 points, 70 percent, my dear Vera. Yeah. You have to go home. Thank you. Show hey. some love. Hey. Ambulance, ambulance. The battle line has been drawn. Five talented actors will come head to head for supremacy as Ghana's next top actor. Ima K, Susan, Fernand, Araba, and Lois are up for the grand finale. Who will become the next top actor? Keep texting your favorite contestant's name to the short code star 714 star 14 hatch. So the final tomorrow, 4 p.m. inside Executive Theater here at TV3. Now moving on to the final story. The story of the Thompsons, a family of five whose personal lives are filled with twists and surprises unfolds on TV3. Deja Vu is a new captivating local drama series which presents Billings Quasi Thompson, the younger of the two older Thompsons who takes on the responsibility of his brother's four children and the running of the family business after his brother's death. Now, wrapped in fame, romance and heartbreaks, the lives of the Thompsons remain imperfect as their past haunts them till they find the persons who can sweep them off their feet. Catch all the action tonight, 9 p.m. here on TV3. So that's about it for entertainment and lifestyle news tonight here on uh, News 360. My name is Nana Quadrado. There's more on 3news.com. Don't forget, I'm black and proud. Deja vu. Can't Deja wait. Vu. Absolutely. Nice. On behalf of the same, we're going to say thank you. My name is Alfred Okonse, and I am black and proud. And I'm Natalie Fort. I'm black and proud. Thanks so much for watching, and have a pleasant evening.